So the reading for today is from the Shandagya Upanishad. Fruit from this banyan tree. Here it is, Father. Break it. It is broken, sir. What do you see in it? Very small seed, sir. Bring one of them, my son. It is broken, sir. What do you see in it? Nothing at all, sir. Then his father spoke to him, My son, from the very essence in the seed which you cannot see, comes in truth this vast banyan tree. Believe me, my son, an invisible and subtle essence is the spirit of the whole universe. That is reality. That is Atman. Thou art that. Explain more to me, Father. So be it, my son. Place this salt in water and come to me tomorrow morning. He did as he was commanded, and in the morning his father said to him, Bring me the salt you put in the water last night. He looked into the water but could not find it, for it had dissolved. His father then said, Taste the water from this side. How is it? The son replied, It is salt. Taste it from the middle. How is it? It is salt. Taste it from that side. How is it? It is salt. Look for that salt again and come to me. The son did so, saying, I cannot see the salt. I only see water. His father then said, In the same way, O oh my son, you cannot see the Spirit, but in truth he is here. An invisible and subtle essence is the spirit of the whole universe. That is reality. That is truth. And thou art that. And so it is. Mm, let us take There are some who would say that to live you must be prepared to die. I would say that. And that song screams that. That prepare yourself for the inevitability that this is it. So pay attention. Hmm. Let's just sit in that for a minute. Well, you're looking at me. I guess I got a job to do, right? I got, what is this? We'll get to work. We'll get to work. I love calling this my job. It's such a cool thing to say. What do you do? I talk. Do people listen? Sometimes. But it's weird calling this a job because it's not like Dusty calls and says, get up and talk, and then the job begins. To do this ministerial type thing, I feel like the job is always, it's constant. It never stops. I can't get off the ministerial train for a second. Because as soon as I sit down, something comes up, and I'm like, ah, that'll preach. <laughs> That's what my uh, Baptist neighbor used to say when he heard something that got him going. He goes, oh, that'll preach. <laughs> and sometimes it's overwhelming. Honestly, sometimes I feel that I want to get off. I don't want to be focused all the time and in spirit all the time. But when I try to get off, it just doesn't feel right. So, yes, this is it. You're at church. I'm at work. So let's begin. So I'm here to talk to you today about that which can't be talked about. I'm here to explain to you that which can't be explained. I'm here to show you that which can't be seen. Yes, that's my job. And I really want to do a good job. I really want to do it well, but I never quite get there. We were speaking you and I, before the service, Melody and I, about the fact that she's like, you got such good words. You're so handsome. Amen. You said, she said the words thing, not the other thing. <laughs> but I could tell she was thinking it because she said it like this. You got such good words. <laughs> no, but seriously. She said, you got such good words, you say what I'm thinking. I'm like, that's cool, but I want to tell you that this is humbly frustrating for me because I never quite say the right thing. I never quite say exactly what I want to say. I'm never quite satisfied when I walk away from here. 
I never quite know if I did it right. Now, yes, sometimes I talk and I feel good about it. I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I did good. Sometimes I talk and I'm like, whoa, what the was I talking about? <laughs> I didn't understand it. I hope they did. <laughs> sometimes I get validation. Sometimes you know, people are like, man, ooh. Sometimes they just kind of walk by. <laughs> How'd I do? Um, but it's never quite enough. It's never quite there. It's never quite perfect, although I want it to be perfect. And I struggle with that, honestly, as a uh, minister. I struggle with that. I struggle with trying to vocalize this invocalizable thing. And it's not just me, and it's not just this job. It's my entire life. I want to know that I'm doing the right thing. I want to know that I'm living the right life. That I have the right job and that I'm working hard enough at that job that I'm actualizing my potential. That I'm making enough money to provide for my family. That I'm surrounding myself with the right people. That I'm doing the right thing. Do you ever feel like that? You ever feel that, I just, what is this, the right life for me? Is this what I was supposed to be doing? Living here, doing this? Is this it? Is this my life? And I constantly question that, constantly. Oh, is this it? Is this it? Am I doing enough? Am I living the right life? Was this what was supposed to be actualized through me? Is it just ego? Do I just stand up here and talk because I'm good at it? So that people will say things like, hey, <laughs> you speak well. What is it? Am I just doing this because, like, I'm, I'm an independent minister, which means that I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> so is that, a, is that an ego thing? Am I doing it right? And I don't think I'm the only one. If I'm the only one, none of this that follows will make any sense to you. But I don't think, I don't think I'm alone. I think we all kind of feel that. Is this the right life for me? Am I doing the right thing? Are these choices the choices that are destined for me? So we look around. <laughs> we look around at our circumstances. And we start to measure them. We get the measuring stick. And we say, this is my job. This is what I do for money. This is what I do for work. I spend a lot of time doing it. Man, most of my life is involved in this. Is this the right job? Is this what gives me meaning? Is this the best use of my talents? I look at that. I look at my family. Am I with the right person? Am I with the person that makes me feel like I can do anything? Am I with the person who lifts me up? Am I lifting them up? Am I a good spouse? Am I a good husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend? Am I good at that? Am I lifting them up? Am I a good father? One day will my children be on a psychiatrist's couch <laughs> talking about their father who cared, this is serious, who cared more about God than he did about them. Don't bother me, children. I'm working on life. I'm working on God, my spirit. Did I give them enough attention? These are the circumstances of our life, and we start wondering if we should rearrange them. We start wondering if this picture that's on my mantle of my life is the right picture. You know the mantle with the picture and the family? Is this it? Because we do. We have a picture in our head about what our life should be, what we should be doing, who we should be surrounding ourselves, what is the right way to parent, what is the right way to work, what is the right way to live. And we have this beautiful picture in our head, and we're wondering if our life is that. It's like a puzzle. Like we're trying to put the pieces together. Ooh, right job. It's a corner piece. Right job. Right family. Right books. Right religion right sexuality, right gender. Ah, there it is. My life. And for some reason, if we feel just a little bit off, if we feel like we're not living the best life possible, what do we do with the puzzle? 
we start rearranging it. We say, well, you know what? I could have a different job that actualizes my potential more. I could get more meaning from this, more money from this. So I'm just going to take that puzzle piece out and put another one there. Ah, this person I'm with. This girl, this boy, this dog. This is not the right dog for me. This is not the right person for me. You don't make me feel good. You don't make me feel like a human being. You don't lift me up. Kicking you to the curb. This is my relationship. I'm just going to move your puzzle piece over here. We call that the trash can. And I'm going to put a new puzzle piece here. I'm going to get a better relationship. So that's what we do with our life, with our circumstances. We start rearranging them to create the perfect picture. And maybe for a month, maybe for two months, maybe for a year, we look at it and we say, that's it. I did it. Hallelujah. Glory. That's Gloria. So we look at the picture. It's on the mantle. When people come over. <laughs> oh, you want to know about my life? There it is. <sighs> but then the pieces start to shift. There's an earthquake. There's a diagnosis. Something in our life moves and the puzzle shifts. Or maybe the puzzle doesn't shift. But in a year, two years, three years, ten years, you look at that puzzle, you look at that picture and you say, that's not it. I'm missing something. I'm missing something. There's something's not right. There's something. This is not the picture of my life. This is not the way it's supposed to be. I'm going to give you a little secret about circumstances. They're circumstantial. <laughs> what? No, it's just, it's not, get out. Really? This is circumstantial? They're circumstantial. They change. They shift. They move. And they are beyond your control. Now, it's great to have a good job. It's great to find a job that gives you meaning. It's great to be with someone who lifts you up and to lift them up. It's great to spend time with your children. It's great to have a dog and love the dog and the cat and the hamster. It's, it's good to do all that. But no picture is going to be good enough. No picture is going to be the right picture. As soon as you get it, something will shift, a piece will fall, life will happen, or you'll just think, crap, I've been working my life for that, and that's not enough. <sighs> So then what do you do? You say, you know what? Screw the picture. I'm just going to do me. I'm just going to do me. I'm going to work on me. I'm going to do what brings me joy. I'm going to surround myself with books that make me feel smart. I don't read books. I just put them around me. <laughs> What's that? It's the Sherman Zucker Upanishad. What's it say? It's something about a seed and, and salt. I think it's a cookbook. <laughs> but you start working on you. You say, you know what? If I can't fix my circumstances, I can fix me. I'm going to start eating right. That's right. Tomorrow. <laughs> Not today. Tomorrow. I'm going to start drinking. I don't drink, so I have to say start drinking. I'm going to start drinking because it makes me feel good. I'm going to do things that bring me pleasure. I'm going to take care of this. Maybe you do that. Maybe you do things that start to bring you joy and you notice the picture starts to shift a bit. Okay, now i got a job that makes me happy. That's cool. Now i got a relationship that makes me happy. That's cool. Now I'm spending more time with my kids playing the football. Go to bed. You know, that's cool. I'm doing things that bring me joy, that make me happy. Ah, oh, and is it enough? Maybe for a day. Maybe for a year. Maybe for 50 years. But that, this body, this body's not it. I can't just do things that bring me joy. This body is just this body. It can't be about me. It can't be about myself. It can't be about my ego. Because no matter how hard I try, I can't perfect this thing called the body. I can't perfect this thing called the hands. I can't just do what brings me joy. The picture is changing. I'm changing. I need to look at my life differently. And then it dawns on you. What did I just say? 
I, it dawned on before that. <laughs> what did I just say? You says it dawned on you. <laughs> no, no, before that. That's good. You're paying attention. That's good. <laughs> Maybe I need to look at my life differently. I've been reading self-help books. They talk about the mind a lot. They talk about perspective. They talk about intention. They talk about seeing life. Maybe the picture on the wall, Elvis Buzz, the picture on the wall is a picture in my head. Maybe life is the way I see it. Maybe success is the way I see it. Maybe a full life is seeing a full life. Maybe I need to see my job differently. Even if I'm not happy there, I can see it as an opportunity, a springboard to something better. Even if I'm not happy in the relationship, maybe I'm not giving enough. Maybe I can see you as the stepping stone to someone else. (sighs) (laughs) Maybe it's all in my head. Maybe I'll practice positive thinking. Because it's positive and negative thinking, and they're just thinking. It's always there. Positive and negative. It's always there. Every time there's a situation, there's always a positive and a negative, a light and a shadow. So maybe I'll just choose the light. Maybe I'll choose to view my life differently. Maybe I'll choose to wake up every morning with the intention to be successful. This is how I walk when I'm successful. (laughs) That'll be two for dinner me and God. Maybe I'll do that. So I have positive intentions. I have positive thoughts. I start choosing wisely. And I notice the picture on the mantle that's really the picture in my head begins to shift and change because now I'm seeing life just a little bit differently. I'm looking for the positive. I'm looking for the positive. I'm looking for the opportunity. I'm looking for the joy. I'm looking for it. And while I do that, I get different jobs. A job that makes me feel good, that I see it. It happens. And and I have my family. My family life's going really good because now I see my children not as a burden, but as opportunities, as the next generation. I got to give to them. Where's God? God's here in front of me. So my thoughts to begin to change the picture and my body, I feel good. I'm eating right. I'm drinking more, less. (laughs) And I'm feeling pretty good. And so a day goes by. A year goes by. Fifty years go by. Woo! Fifty years go by. Oh. Okay, it's morning. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to have positive thoughts. I'm going to think positively. I'm going to change my life. I'm in control. I'm making my life. I'm making it. W. Wayne W. said, change your thoughts, change your life. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. I'm changing my life. I'm changing my life. Life's going well. Life's going good. And you're exhausted. <laughs> Just exhausted treating your life like a puzzle, (laughs) putting it together, treating your body (laughs) like it's you, you know, like it's this prize you've won. Look at me, hit the jackpot. Treating your mind and your thoughts as the vehicle to gain and create. And it's going well and it's going good, but no matter how hard I try, there's still something missing. No matter how hard I try to hold this picture in my head about what my life should be, the more I try to hold on to it, the more I wake up exhausted, not wanting to do anything. And maybe it takes a year, maybe it takes 50 years, but it's exhausting. You ever tried to create a life? Not that way. That's easy. It's exhausting. Trying to make the perfect life. Trying to make the life you should have. Trying to create the picture on the mantle, whether it's on the mantle or in your mind. Trying to work your way. Trying to think your way to fulfillment. Try it. 
It's exhausting. So then one morning, one morning I wake up. By the way, this is not a story. This is my life. <laughs> so one morning I wake up. I don't, I don't want, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. So I walk out. My children are asleep. My wife's asleep. It's early. You know, so I, I, I make some coffee. And then I open my back door to the porch and I walk out with my coffee. And I just stand there for a moment. And then it starts to rain just a little bit. And I can hear it. I can hear the rain. It's like... I feel a slight breeze go by me. And I take a sip of coffee. And life makes sense. In that one moment, I stumble upon the secret to it all. This whole time, I've been trying to live the right life and missing life. The whole time I've been trying to create the right life and missing life. What do they say? Life is what happens when you're busy making plans. So I'm out there on the porch and in that moment, it's the taste of the coffee. In that moment, it's the sound of the rain. In that moment, it's the fact that I sense my children stirring and my wife yawning and it all wraps around me and I realize this is life. You see, life is not my circumstances. Life transcends my circumstances. Life is not my body. Life transcends my body. Life is not what I think life is. Life is not my thoughts. Life transcends my thoughts. Life is beyond all those things. Life is the singular thing that we're participating in. We are all living what? Life. There is no such thing as the good life. Life is good. There's no such thing as the perfect life. Life is perfect in its muck, in its mess, in its hurricane, in its cancer, in its life, in its death. That's life. That's death. That's existence. And it's a freaking miracle. And while you're busy trying to put pieces together and sort things out, life's just there looking at you going, I thought you were going to say, what you talking about, Willis? What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's better than, <laughs> exactly, what you doing? I'm right here. What are you looking for? Life, okay, I'll be quiet. Life asks us to do one thing. Pay attention. Life asks us to do one thing, show up. That's it. Right between your circumstances, your body, and your mind, there exists this thing called life, and you are here to experience it. The fullness of life, life in its absolute morality, hugeness, life in its miracle, life in its full actualization exists in a touch. This touching Carol is more than I could ever hope to gain from life. It's in the experience. It's in the interaction. It's where the mind, body, and circumstances meet. It's that one place that's bigger than it all, that's smaller than it all, that transcends it all. It's here, and you're going to miss it if you don't stop to notice. Thank you. I got lost in it. Life is what transcends all of this. You are an incarnation. It means God is experiencing life through you. When you see, God sees. When you touch, God touches. When you smell, God smells. And that's what you're here to do. You're here to do those things to experience this life. There's a great scene in the movie Tombstone. You ever seen the movie Tombstone? Yay! 
Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp are best friends. Doc Holliday has tuberculosis. He's been dying his whole life. And he's laying on the bed moments from death. How do you know that he's dying? Because they start to play poker and Doc Holliday says, I don't want to play anymore. So they start talking and Doc says to Wyatt, what do you want? And Wyatt says, I just want to live a simple life. And Doc says, there is no simple life. There's just life. Now get on with it. That's it. That's the secret to being alive. You're already living the best life possible. You're already living your truth. You're already living your miracle. You're already living your destiny. And in the meantime, get a good job. Why not? Why not? Get a job that brings you meaning and purpose. Surround yourself with people who uplift you. Spend your life with a partner who makes you feel that you can do anything and do the same for them. Love your children. Give them the greatest gift you can give them. Time, presence, be with them. Do all those things and more. Have positive thoughts. That's great. Wake up in the morning with intention. Practice positive thinking. Look for the good in people for crying out loud. It's there, even though it's kind of small sometimes. <laughs> Look for it. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Offer love unconditionally with absolutely no reservation. But in the meantime, don't miss this. While you're doing all that, don't miss this. Because this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. You ever heard of spirituality? Triangle Center for Spiritual Living? And, and, oh, that's right. Oh, it's not on there anymore. Spirituality in action. Spirituality does a lot of cool things. My job, my job, what I do, is spirituality. Spirituality, it's a practice. It's a discipline. Spirituality is primarily concerned with one thing. Transcendence. Spirituality's goal is to get you beyond your thoughts, beyond your mind, beyond your circumstance. Spirituality's goal is to get you into the very marrow of living, to get you down deep into the one single lived experience of being alive. Spirituality is supposed to transport you there. It's supposed to get you there. And spirituality comes with two doors. This is what I'm going to leave you with. Have I been talking a long time? Uh, it seems like a minute. I like you. <laughs> Keep going. Okay, hold on. Let's think of some other things to talk about. Okay, I had a uh, Christmas in July and Christmas cakes. And, okay, good. It's bone marrow. Got it. Okay, there's two doors. Spirituality has two doors to offer you. Two doors. Dos puertos. Two doors. Is that right? See? Yeah. See? Okay. Dos puertos. Two doors. Now, I cannot walk through these doors for you. I can just show them to you. I honestly can't tell you what's beyond them. <laughs> there are no words. All I can do is say, here, give this a try. Door number one, behind door number one, we call this the doorway out. The first door of transcendence, the first door of spirituality is the doorway out. Go out into the world and pay attention. The next time you feel bogged down, the next time you feel like, well, is this my life? Is this the right life? Am I I'm doing things? I'm angry. I stubbed my toe. Ah, my arm. Michael Fawcett, my arm hurts. I'm just kidding, dude. It's cool. But next time, <laughs> next time you feel that way, walk through door number one. It's the doorway into experience. Some call it mindfulness. If you're in a room, be in the room. Look at the walls. Smell the air. Mm, mm, yes, touch something, feel the touch. Body, move through the body to the touch. See what you see, smell what you smell, touch what you touch. Be in the moment. Door number one is the door into this moment. Next time you feel frustrated, stop this thing. Freedom, let's say freedom for thinking. I like to say freedom from thinking. <laughs> Take a break. 
Walk through door number one into the moment. Be in the moment. Stop describing it. Stop judging it. Be in it. Door number one. What's through it? I don't know. Give it a shot. Door number two. Doors of transcendence. La puerta numero dos. That's pretty good. Door number one, the doorway out. Door number two, the doorway in. If that doesn't work for you, shut it down. Shut it down. Shut down the thinking. Shut down the moving. Try your best to shut down almost all the breath. Door number two, the doorway in is the doorway is the portal into the very depths of your being. It's into the silence, into the stillness, into the space. This is the door of life, the door of rise to life, the door of consciousness of being. Let it all go and just sink. This door just requires letting go. Let go of thoughts, let go of emotions, let go of what you see and just sink. Doorways to transcendence, out and in, out and in, out and in. And if you keep walking through them, you might realize, I don't know, just saying, that it's actually one door and they lead to the same place. I wanted to say something about Christmas. My daughter, I'm going to end with this, I promise. My daughter loves Christmas. And they have these Christmas cakes. It's called Christmas in July. So I want to give you, there it is, I found it. Okay, I want to give you a little taste of Christmas in July. The best Christmas I ever spent was in the cardiac ICU. The best Christmas of my life. I had a heart thing. I won't go into it. But I was rushed there, all these measurements and things. And it's like, hey, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> and then I wake up and I'm in the cardiac ICU and it's Christmas morning. And I open my eyes and I'm like, it's Christmas. No trees, no lights, no presents, no family. It's Christmas. Beyond my definition, beyond the songs, beyond what I think it is, it's Christmas. That's life. You might have an idea of what it should be, but one day you'll wake up and realize it's life. Let's pray. Come on. Let's get on the piano. I just want to lean on the piano. Mm. Oh, there it is. Whenever I give my kids a speech, like a really dad speech, I want you to be there playing the piano. Listen, kids. It's like full, my daughters are watching Full House now, which is weird because I watched it when I was like seven. And now every time there's something happening, it's, listen, life's going to get you down. All right, you can close your eyes if you want. You don't have to. It's all good. You can look. Just take one deep breath with me. And if it feels good, take another. I am thankful for the lived experience, the one experience of being alive that we all share, that we all participate in. I'm thankful for the gift of incarnation, the gift of being, the gift of awareness and consciousness. I'm thankful for listening to Melody and touching Carol's shoulder and hearing your smiles and your sadness. I'm thankful for all of this. Because I know it's a gift. I know every morning I wake up, I'm waking up to the miracle of life itself. And as I try to work on it, as I try to move my puzzle around, I'm just going to let it be. I'm going to look at the puzzle and say, that's nice today. Tomorrow I'll change it. But in the meantime, I just take a breath. And I live. In gratitude, peace, and love. Namaste, and so it is. Amen, and thank you for listening. I appreciate it. And thank you, Cindy.